My name is Dr. Marsha Inhorn. I'm a professor of anthropology and international affairs here at Yale University. And I am chair of the Council on Middle East Studies. And this is our inaugural lecture today. Um, and in fact, the first in a very wonderful series of presentations, both lectures and book talks uh, given by Yale faculty this fall term. We're going to be meeting every Thursday, usually at this time at noon. And uh, so I really invite you to keep tuning in on Thursdays for what I think is going to be a wonderful series of lectures and talks about various uh, issues in the Middle Eastern region. But today I'm very excited. I'm very, very happy to be introducing our inaugural speaker, um, uh, a very late breaking session um, on the situation in Afghanistan. And he's Dr. Nason Adil Parvar, who I have to say is one of our very favorite members of the Council on Middle East Studies community. Dr. Adil Parvar has been working for many years now as an advisor to the United Nations Development Program in conflict affected settings, including in Afghanistan. And so currently he works for UNDP's Crisis Bureau in New York City. But we at Yale were very lucky to have Dr. Adil Parvar here with us for four years uh, as a postdoctoral fellow, both at the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies and in the anthropology department, where he did a variety of different things, but he taught for us courses on the Middle East, on forced migration, on conflict. Um, Dr. Otto Parvar's training, he received his PhD at the University of Sussex's Institute of Development Studies, where his research focused on the effects of the post-2001 political reconstruction that affected inter-ethnic relations in Afghanistan. And I have to say that his particular focus in Afghanistan has been on the situation of the Hazaras, a Shia Muslim minority group that has suffered unduly under the Taliban. And to that end, he recently published a truly haunting chapter on their situation entitled Navigating Precarity, Prejudice and Return, the Unsettlement of Displaced Afghans in Iran and Afghanistan, which was uh, published in our new book, a new book called Unsettling Middle Eastern Refugees, Regimes of Exclusion and Inclusion in the Middle East, Europe and North America. It came out uh, just this, this year in the Berghan book series on forced migration. And I have to say that it features uh, work by other Yale faculty members who've been working on the Middle East refugee crisis, including Dr. Otto Parvar's work on Afghanistan. And so we're, we're really lucky at Yale that we've had Dr. Otto Parvar in our midst because he is a long-term expert on Afghanistan. And he's here to talk about it probably for about 30 minutes. He's going to give a, a brief lecture, but then we're going to open it up for Q&A. He's very willing to take your questions um, uh, about the, the current situation. And to that end, you can use the chat function at the bottom of your screens to pose written questions um, that Dr. Adil Parvar will be able to see and then answer uh, through that mechanism. And so I'm very excited to hear this talk. Um, and the title is Usurping the Afghan State, the Return of the Taliban, Humanitarian Crisis, and Implications for International Engagement. And I want to welcome back Dr. Nason Adil Parvar, who I should mention is the new father of a beautiful baby boy, Indigo Adil Parvar. Uh, we'll consider him to be the newest member of our community, Nason. So uh, you can take it from here. I'm so glad uh, to have you here for this lecture today. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. It's, it's uh, really nice to be uh, coming back to CMES and to Yale to, to give this inaugural lecture. Um, and, and thank you for the invitation. I know it was very timely and we, you know, we put this together quickly so we could actually you know, appeal to the, the Yale population. Um, just to say thank you to you uh, and to thank you also to Kristen and Mara at the uh, Council of Middle East Studies for helping put this all together uh, so quickly. Um, I'm going to share a PowerPoint, which I'm going to uh, walk you all through as I kind of move forward. Uh, really, what I'm going to do today is, is I'm not, not presenting kind of any new research given the time frame we're dealing with, but essentially just kind of give a backgrounder and some information on the recent return of the Taliban, some of the reasons that led to that very uh, quick uh, return to power, talk a little bit about the um, current context on the grounds, focusing on the kind of building humanitarian and economic crisis in the country, and talk a little bit about the international response. And really to end up on questions around what this means for international engagement moving forward, uh, but also 
to really answer a few big questions, which I'm going to pose at the end. And these are things that I'm still thinking through. So uh, as Marsha said, I'm really looking forward to kind of presenting this to stimulate some discussion, but also as a chance to answer your questions as well. So everyone should be able to see the, the PowerPoint screen that's just come up. So, as I said, what, what I'm going to do over the first few slides is really just use a series of maps to show the rapid shift or rapid return of the Taliban um, and also address what I've put here as tactical factors. So these are things that happened on the ground, mostly in terms of what the Taliban did that led to that kind of very rapid resurgence. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've called strategic factors, kind of the overarching factors that allowed this uh, to happen in this kind of very quick time frame. Um, as you can see on the maps there, they're color coordinated. The white are the government controlled areas held by the previous uh, government. The um, dark orange are Taliban controlled areas and the kind of mid, mid level color. Those are contested districts where the Taliban have some sort of foothold and which they're influencing the kind of uh, governance mechanisms and people in place. Uh, the US troop withdrawal began on May the 1st. Uh, and just to note there that the Taliban troop numbers are estimated around 80,000 individuals, where the Afghan forces had a no nominal 300,000. And the reason that I've italicized the nom nominal and put the question mark there is, as I'll talk in a moment, on the ground, given um, attrition and deaths to the, the Afghan forces, the actual numbers of Afghan forces are somewhere in the region of 50,000 to 150,000 troops. I'd probably say somewhere at the 150,000 level, but a lot less that was that was initially estimated or assumed uh, going into this um, the set of circumstances. So, looking at these first three um, these uh, first three maps here, um, we see the kind of a starting scenario in which, as the U.S. troops began to withdraw, the government retained control of all 34 provincial centres in Afghanistan. The Taliban had um, a good footing in many of the rural areas. Uh, and, and many of those areas that weren't in the Central Highlands region uh, and the other parts of the country. But as the Taliban by May 11th began to consolidate their control over major, major highways, they were cutting off those government bases and some of the more remote operations in the country. And as this happened, more rural districts fell and they started to kind of position themselves in these areas. You'll also see as we go through the maps that initially the Taliban were focusing on some of the northern areas of the country before moving elsewhere. And I'll talk about the significance of that a little later. So moving into June, there was a scenario in which the besieged Afghan forces began to understand that the government was not able to send reinforcement or the supplies that were needed to maintain and hold those positions. And as a result, demoralized, they began to ab abandon many checkpoints and bases en masse. And it was around this point that the Taliban essentially began to take control of large stockpiles of weapons, vehicles, munitions, and military equipment, uh, which had primarily been supplied to the Afghan military by US forces. And now the Taliban hold many of those and essentially a very well-stocked fighting force. Going through uh, early to mid-June there, we see the Taliban slowly taking control of more areas, particularly in the north, as I mentioned, but also elsewhere, until we get into, into July. Um, there is a um, inflection point there, which I'll talk about in a moment, which is the US understanding the Taliban were actually expanding their presence and their foothold was true from Bagram Air Base on July the 2nd. And we see here continuous um, taking of control by the Taliban into July 13th on the right there. And this was a really key moment. Up until this point, there was actually very, or including at this point, there was very little military action on the ground, fighting per se. There were some sporadic fights in different parts of the country. But at this point, with the kind of tide turning in their favor and lots of desertions of uh, the Afghan military, the Taliban essentially started dispatching diplomatic efforts, dispatching um, local elders to essentially tell local forces, military forces, to surrender or die. And in many cases, the, these were negotiated with the um, allowance of those local police and military to leave with their lives, essentially, 
uh, and, and to return to their, their places of origin in the country. So again, kind of a diplomatic effort in which many further uh, outposts and military bases were uh, surrendered to the Taliban. Going into this last set of um, uh, maps here, we see that by August 3rd, the Taliban really settled into some intensified uh, sieges around some key provincial capitals. Um, government troops and officials began to abandon even these more fortified compounds, so a, a continuing kind of set of desertion as the Taliban momentum build, and they started to peel off a lot of uh, these kind of peripheral and then more central military and security installations. On August 6th, and this began the 10-day run on major provincial cities and ultimately Kabul for the Taliban, on August 6th, um, Zaranj, which is the provincial capital of Nimruz in the south of the country there, you can see on the August 8th map, fell to the Taliban. And this was the first of many. Now, it's probably worth pointing out that as we move towards August um, 14th and ultimately August 15th, which the ultimate takeover of Kabul, the very strategic and major cities in the country, including Herat in the west, Kandahar and Helmand in the south, did experience some fighting, um, but ultimately were um, handed over to the Taliban, uh, those three major centers. And then just around Kabul, in Kunduz and Logar, those areas that collapsed to Taliban control, essentially now then um, progression onto Kabul. Now it goes without saying that this was I think to everyone, including the Taliban, this was extremely rapid and unexpected. I mean, we saw that as I'll talk in a moment in terms of the response of the US and the withdrawals that then took place. And I'm sure many of you witnessed uh, some of the footage of what was taking place. Those very, very dire circumstances, very unpleasant circumstances. But really this was a very rapid, um, rapid rise that was very much unexpected. So looking at some of those broader strategic factors, I'd said earlier that I think the Taliban were very, very shrewd in focusing on, not exclusively, but focusing on those northern areas that historically had been more resistant and had managed to hold out longer um, during their previous ascent to power in the mid 1990s. So they started focusing in these areas, essentially securing what they saw to be the, the greatest areas of dissent, um, the Panchia Valley aside, um, which essentially didn't fall or is still in a state of flux, but the Taliban have made very significant ground into the Panchia Valley, um, which happened over the last few days. And in doing this, they were very clever in essentially using, as I said, diplomatic rather than military means to win over many of the strategic outposts and provincial capitals, negotiating their uh, surrender, essentially. Another factor that kind of undermined the um, Afghan military operations with the withdrawal of US troops. Now we heard a lot about those two and a half thousand troops that were remaining in country that were withdrawn, which obviously helped guide and support military operations. But what's often less talked about are the 17,000 private US contractors that underpinned the logistical operations for the Afghan army. This is uh, the moving of supplies and reinforcements um, and a lot of the um, support to airstrikes and other elements of uh, operations, which is one of the reasons, as, as we saw earlier, that reinforcements were not arriving uh, to a lot of the um, locations that needed them and contributed to that, 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 that collapse and surrender. I think there are two other broad uh, factors here, one of them being the endemic corruption and governance failures generally in Afghanistan, which undermine trust in the government and I think therefore a desire to support it alongside the withdrawal of troops, people feeling very uh, uncomfortable and alienated from, from the Afghan state, but also this, uh, this, this corruption that underpinned what was taking place in the funding of the Afghan military. It was assumed to be 300,000 troops. In actuality, half that number or less, primarily because of ghost workers who are individuals that don't actually exist, but are on payrolls with um, senior individuals, you know, uh, pocketing a lot of those salaries so these individuals didn't exist. And then just corruption in terms of the supply of goods uh, to those uh, Afghan forces, essentially um, undermining their ability to operate, but also um, their uh, ability to receive support, again, leading to those large scale desertions. 
And I think a last point to probably point out is um, President Ghani had really isolated himself from the major warlords and militias in Afghanistan. Now, this was part his efforts to disempower them, to try to put in place um, a, a legitimate government structure, um, which obviously was one of the, the um, points that he had agreed with the US and he really pushed coming into office. But that really worked against him when it came time to try to rely on these warlords, their militias and, and other individuals and mobilize them against the Taliban. Uh, and he, he found it very hard as a, um, a lot of uh, discussion of his trip to Mazar in the north, trying to rally a, a number of warlords and key fingers there against the Taliban, which ultimately was unsuccessful. And part of that, I think, is also his personal governing style. He was seen as um, quite a difficult individual who really tried to sideline a lot of opposition. So I think part of it is to do with his own, his own standing there as well. Now, I want to talk a, a little bit about the actual US withdrawal and evacuations themselves. Um, you know, there's been a lot of a lot of discussion of where blame lies, whether that lies with President Trump and his initiation of the um, agreement and peace negotiations, primarily with the Taliban, whether that rests with President Biden, whether that rests with uh, other individuals and in the broader two decade intervention. Um, I'm not gonna come in and, and try and take a, a political standpoint, but I think there were some very key failures in place and I wanna run, run through a few of those. Now, I think the, the withdrawal itself, alongside the peace negotiations that were taking place um, over the recent period was, was definitely a very, was a, a too rapid process. Um, essentially, by the time the US decided that they wanted to pull out, um, there was a signaling initially with President Trump uh, initiating his uh, agreement with the Taliban and initiating peace negotiations. I think he signaled very clearly that the US wanted to get out, um, which indicated to the Taliban that they essentially just had to play the game of peace negotiations, not do anything to upset the US so that they would continue that withdrawal. President Biden obviously inherited um, that scheduling and, and those set, sets of circumstances. Um, he obviously had a choice about how to continue. He did push back the, the date of withdrawal a little toward to, um, you know, to, to in, beginning in, in the 1st of May, as we saw just previously. Um, but I still think, I think he was hoping to complete a withdrawal um, and, and, and claim the benefits of that withdrawal, potentially blaming any um, shortcomings on President Trump. But I think there were a number of strategic errors he made as well in moving forward. Um, one of them was essentially to time the, the withdrawal still in the summer fighting season. A lot of people I've seen have been talking about, you know, why didn't we wait until the winter when the Taliban would have much more limited capacity to exploit the US withdrawal at that time, essentially buying more time for um, the Afghan government and Afghan forces to secure their positions. And their relationship with the Taliban. That may have not changed the outcome, but it definitely would have bought more time. I think another um, strategic error was the withdrawal from Bagram Air Base on July the 2nd. Um, this resulted in the loss of a, an asset that could have been used for defense purposes, but also to kind of support evacuations. Now, I think obviously in both of those cases, these steps were taken um, assuming that the collapse of the uh, go government wasn't inevitable. And if it would happen, it would take a matter of months, not a matter of days. So I can understand why those steps were taken, but you would like to think that the, the US military, which is possibly the best funded organization in the world would have put sufficient contingency planning in place. I think Biden and the, the US administration then found themselves in a very tough, tough position having to withdraw uh, um, and evacuate many um, US citizens, other foreign nationals and um, vulnerable Afghans. One of the things I think, which was because the US, let's say, wasn't well positioned to withdraw sufficiently in the time they had left, this led to a number of things that the administration had to do. One of them was, I think, in error, having over a list of the names of those Afghans that supported US forces, um, basically trying to have the Taliban agree to their uh, 
for the future departure from the country. Um, essentially, that's been called a kill list because I, I do believe that that would put them in, in very grave, da grave danger moving forward, essentially indicating to the Taliban um, who those individuals are. And I think ultimately the US had to acquiesce to Taliban demands to withdraw fully by August 31st uh, from Kabul airport um, because they knew they couldn't get everyone out, out in time because of some of the, the planning challenges that I've already mentioned. Um, because again, they were trying to receive assurances from the Taliban to, to be able to extract those um, individuals later. Hopefully that will still be the case and it will prove to be a wise decision in the kind of, under the constraints that uh, the US experienced. However, I should say, given those kind of um, critiques that between August 14th and the 31st, the US was able to evacuate 124,000 uh, citizens, other foreign nationals and vulnerable Afghans, which is an unbelievable feat given the security challenges, the uh, bombing by the Islamic State in Khurram province that we saw. Um, so very, very challenging circumstances. They did manage to withdraw a very large number of in individuals. Um, they did leave behind around 100 US citizens uh, currently negotiating their um, departure and also an kind of as yet uncalculated number of Afghans that worked alongside the US who obviously are at great risk. And that number is somewhere in the, the thousands, possibly tens of thousands. It's not yet entirely clear. So just before I, I start to talk about the context on the ground in Afghanistan, I just wanted to, to share the current state of the Taliban government, which was put into place um, or announced a few days ago. Uh, you can see on the right there a graphic which shows the, some of the key positions and some of the key individuals. Um, I'm not going to go through all of their profiles, but I will highlight one or two. And despite calls for inclusivity from the international um, community, the Taliban have essentially um, put in place senior leadership, which are all old guard Talibs. So no consideration even for younger generations or consideration for other uh, groups in Afghan society. It's perhaps not unsurprising, but um, I'd say is somewhat concerning. They are all mostly Pashtuns at the senior levels. There is one Tajik and one Hazara, both of whom are actual Talibs. And there are no women in these uh, senior positions or any of the, the deputy positions for the ministries that have been established. Uh, what is of concern and makes it increasingly hard, even if um, the international community wanted to recognize the Taliban government, is that a number of these individuals are on UN and US sanctions list and, and, and terrorist um, blacklists. Um, that includes Ahund, who's on the US sanctions list, and Haqqani, who is very famous for um, heading up the Haqqani network that has been responsible for the deaths of many US citizens. Uh, and it currently has a $5 million um, price uh, on his head on the FBI um, most wanted list. So these, these aren't pleasant individuals, as you'd imagine. It's also probably worth pointing out the Ministry of Vice and Virtue has returned and the Ministry of Women Affairs has been abolished. At this point, there's very little further information on the Taliban government um, but what we see here are some of those key figures, both key military and political figures um, on that graphic to the right. What I wanted to do is, is really turn to the, the growing humanitarian and economic crisis in Afghanistan to paint a picture of the considerations for both the Taliban and the international community moving forward. I think it's safe to say that Afghanistan is already experiencing a humanitarian crisis, which is gonna significantly deteriorate over the coming days, months, and years. At the time the Taliban have come into power, one in three Afghans are food insecure. That's almost 14 million Afghans, of which 2 million children are, are malnourished. That's a, a very, very significant number to deal with. At the same time, most Afghans are currently living in poverty, which has been dramatically, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, increased due to COVID-19 and the um, economic impacts of COVID-19, the soaring prices, um, limited mobility to access um, health clinics, for example, and the um, 
the few resources coming into the country to address both the public health and border kind of implications. So you can see there some of those figures. You're looking at Daikundi with 90% of the population um, in poverty. Some of these figures are dramatically high. Kabul at 34% does somewhat balance out these statistics, but on average, we're looking at somewhere in the region of 72% of the country experiencing poverty. I mean, that, these are um, astounding figures, astounding numbers to have to deal with. And this has been, uh, let's say, complicated, further complicated by the massive internal displacement in the country. Um, let's not forget about the hundreds of thousands of individuals that have left the country in the past month or so, but the almost well, over half a million individuals displaced in 2021. This displacement is on the one hand being driven by the conflict with uh, very large numbers, hundreds of thousands being displaced over the last um, four to six weeks itself, given the, the Taliban's kind of very aggressive uh, rise or a return to power, but also by climate change. You know, we're seeing particularly rapid increases in the risk of um, droughts and floods in Afghanistan, particularly in the mountain regions, which are a large proportion of the country. So again, these figures will continue to rise even just from the, the climate change um, perspective. And we are seeing uh, basic services collapsing in Afghanistan. I'll talk about this a little bit further in, in a moment, but that's partly from the withdrawal or the inability to deliver aid with a lot of international organizations withdrawing uh, all of their staff over the past number of weeks to understand what's taking place in the country, partly because the Taliban have not had an experience uh, of delivering those services, and partly due to a lack of funding to support those services. Which takes me to our next slide. Alongside this kind of catastrophic, catastrophic humanitarian situation, we've got a very problematic economic situation and outlook for the country. So a lot, as you'd imagine, a lot of um, international financing from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, for example, has been suspended. There were loans to the Afghan government. Uh, a lot of international aid has been withdrawn or um, kind of paused until this, uh, the situation becomes much more clear. The banking sector, which was essentially at the heart of the um, Taliban, the Afghan economy, sorry, um, is really in crisis. Very, very limited cash reserves, um, in addition to which existing sanctions have frozen uh, billions of dollars in Taliban assets overseas, so they don't have access to those. The currency is in slide depreciation, depreciation slide, the price of basic goods are soaring and medicines are soaring. Um, and we're gonna see significant reductions in incomes, rising unemployment and growing poverty on top of those figures that we've already seen. So a real economic crisis just over the hill that the Taliban are gonna to have to deal with, which essentially leads to the understanding that there are no funds currently available to support the mid to long-term functioning of government or delivery of public services. It's a real challenges that the Taliban are going to have to navigate in the coming weeks, months. So what about the international response, both to the rise of the Taliban, but also to these kind of very precarious circumstances? So the G7 currently led by the United Kingdom and obviously including the United States have been seeking a unified approach in which members of the G7 and, and other key donor countries are unified essentially in holding the threat of further sanctions over the Taliban, really to see if they're going to honor some of the things the international community really would like to see. At the same time, the release of those frozen Taliban assets uh, potentially on the table, should the Taliban uh, agree to the formation of an inclusive government, uh, concessions on human rights for women, girls, and minorities, and a commitment to give up uh, terrorism. Now, I'd say for a, a number of reasons, um, this is unlikely to concede, to succeed. It does, given the economic circumstances we've just seen, um, potentially place a lot of control in the hands of Western donors. 
The reason I don't think it's going to be very successful is seeking to isolate the Taliban with further sanctions is unlikely to work, partly because Pakistan, Russia, and particularly China, I think are poised to fill the vacuum that's been created by the departure of the US and Western allies. If we already look at what's taken place, um, it's clearly not an inclusive government that the Taliban has stood up. I mean, they are saying that it's still a work in progress and that they, you will see some women in, in junior positions, but that yet is to be seen. And even then, uh, the exclusive nature of the government is, is deeply concerning. Concessions for on human rights for women and girls. The Taliban have asked that women currently re re um, remain at home, um, don't go out to work, limit their movement outside unless they have a mahram, a, a male um, family member or close relation to escort them. So already we're seeing signs that those human rights may be trampled upon uh, and a commitment to give up terrorism. The Taliban have been very, very quiet about talking about their relationships with Al-Qaeda and the Haqqani network, but we've seen the appointment of the previous head, existing head of the Haqqani network um, in the senior levels of government. Um, and there are still believed to be very strong relationships between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Um, so none of these terms currently, I would say, are likely to be met. The UN, uh, meanwhile, has called for a donor pledging conference, um, estimating that $600 million will be required to provide uh, humanitarian support to uh, Afghans. Um, and the Secretary General came out yesterday, uh, I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before, essentially saying that it's crucial that we um, offer humanitarian aid to Afghanistan, both to alleviate poverty and hunger, um, with the dire circumstances we are seeing and are going to see more of. But he also said that this is a way to help the Taliban recognize that they need to commit to certain things if they wish to receive that aid moving forward. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the forthcoming slide about how that might um, shape up. Now, while no um, countries have officially recognized the Taliban government, the, U the EU has announced that it will reopen an office to manage, manage coordination, I wouldn't say close relations, but coordination with the new Afghan government and to coordinate um, and distribute aid as that uh, process unfolds and moves forward. As I said earlier, Russia, China, and Pakistan, excuse me, while not officially recognizing the new government, have been much more positive and have made statements, negative statements against the, the US and the efforts that they've undertaken over the past two decades, as you would probably imagine. Um, there is a possibility, and this I think is a really key strategic factor that we need to bear in mind, there is a possibility that the Taliban will approach China to address their economic woes that we've just talked about. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, in Africa, for example, China has a very um, simple, uh, um, let's say, model of international cooperation. They give funding to a host government in, um, in return for extraction of resources, essentially. And Afghanistan has somewhere in the, the, um, an estimated $3 trillion in, in um, mineral resources in the country that China would want to access, um, including very large copper reserves, which China already has attempted to with, um, take out of the ground, but has been unable to do so previously because of the Taliban targeting officials and blocking roads. If they were to strike this new relationship with, uh, with the Taliban essentially being given free passage and guarantees of security, it would be very advantageous to China in exchange for the, some financial resources for the, for the government. Yesterday, China pledged $31 million in humanitarian aid and 3 million COVID vaccines for Afghanistan. So it's yet to be seen exactly um, what takes place. Okay, just a few more slides and I'll, I'll wrap up. So what does this really say for um, international engagement moving forward? Well, as I kind of implied earlier, the Taliban are in a position where they re require external support to govern, to deliver services and, uh, and to kind of alleviate the humanitarian crisis engulfing the country. That said, I don't believe they're gonna compromise very much from this support. Uh, one of the risks, for example, of unfreezing high levels of um, Taliban assets 
is that as the Taliban have shown time and time again, they talk a good game, but ultimately they'll talk it, they'll make the agreement, they'll get those assets or concessions, for example, in the peace negotiations, and then do something entirely different, which essentially is just for their own benefit. I'd argue that the US and Western nations have an imperative to help the Afghan uh, people based on the circumstances that they've been left in um, and, the, and the, you know, the, the grave humanitarian and economic um, challenges that are going to come. Uh, I think there's also a desire, a very clear desire for the, the US and Western nations to engage to influence the Taliban, as we've seen with the G7's attempts and the, the um, arguments of the UN Secretary General. As I've said, there's uh, very much we need to be wary of the Taliban agreeing to this. Um, I think another point here is the delivery of aid poses major ethical and operational challenges for the international community, assuming the Taliban wish to allow this to happen. I think one of the major ones here is about helping Afghans versus helping the Taliban government. Even if you're very directly working at local levels, um, staving off hunger, working to alleviate poverty, you're still essentially um, removing obstacles to the Taliban's way and propping up the functioning of their, their government. So there's a real ethical concern here about how and to what extent we support the Afghan people while also supporting the Afghan government. And it's a tough conundrum. I would think that the desire to support the Afghan people would outweigh any benefits to, to the Taliban, but that will obviously be decided by um, a lot of uh, senior individuals in, in many kind of um, international capitals around the world. I think on the operational challenges, it's already been talked about by a lot of individuals, but aid being delivered with humanitarian, uh, sorry, human rights red lines. Essentially, that aid will be delivered only if the Taliban stands up to uh, supporting or at least not targeting minorities and women. Um, this is very difficult to monitor, I think, given the limited access that we have in Afghanistan and the clamping down on local media that we've already seen that the Taliban is doing. Um, I know there are efforts on the ground to track this uh, ongoing, to try and inform the international community and those donors that are giving money. Um, it will be challenging to do so. And the question remains, what happens if your objective is to help the Afghan people, but the Taliban do not respect those red lines? Do you with then withdraw support? I think what would have to happen would be some sort of negotiated discussion, a phased withdrawal of funding in which the Taliban see that you're serious about pulling out those funds um, and, and giving them time to address transgressions and to kind of support those um, human rights red lines. If ultimately they don't, I think there's a case to be argued that then it's about withdrawing um, international support because if they're going to abuse that support, then uh, well, it becomes a very challenging ethical consideration as I mentioned earlier. And I don't think there's any clear answers. I do think that that international support can be delivered by um, non-government organizations, particularly international NGOs that have already worked with the Taliban, delivering aid in areas previously controlled by the Taliban. I know the, um, with them taking control, the power relationships have shifted, but I believe that there are those relationships that can be built, up, built upon to deliver international aid at local levels if required. As I said earlier, the real kind of kingmaker or linchpin in the, the West strategy will depend very much on China and to what extent China step up to fund the Taliban government as an alternative source of funding without any um, of these kind of value-based um, strings attached. I think just other considerations are, we are gonna see dissent emerge over time. To what degree is unclear? We've already seen some small scale demonstrations with quite violent re repercussions to those individuals involved in demonstrations, but also the media covering them. Um, there's also a very significant youth bulge in Afghanistan. 64% of Afghans under the age of 25 who have experienced, or a, a large number of them have experienced opportunities that um, will no longer be available to them and will be demanding employment and opportunities from the Taliban government and we're yet to see how the Taliban, if and how the Taliban will respond, and if they're actually actually able to govern in a way that will allow or enable those things to happen. Final point here is the security, I think, will undoubtedly decline. Um, we saw the Islamic State striking uh, the US in Kabul airport. Uh, 
but there is a deep enmity between the Taliban and the Islamic State, which I think it would be safe to say will continue to grow. And you will have a um, almost a role reversal in which the Taliban are governing and trying to maintain control in certain rural areas with the Islamic State destabilizing and potentially carrying out attacks against the government. It's yet to be seen exactly how that relationship plays out. And if indeed the US will choose to intervene um, given the attacks we saw against U.S. forces by uh, the Islamic State in, in Khorasan province. I think we'll also, to some extent, begin to see some sort of resistance moving, movements appearing. I think the Taliban is very good at quashing them so far, and we saw the, the attempts in the Panjshir Valley recently for um, kind of a holdout, um, that the Panjshiri, Tajik Panjshiri is holding out in that area and not being entirely successful in doing so. They still hold strategic points of the valley, but the Taliban have actually um, been able to enter. I think it's, we're only allowed to see, we're only going to see significant resistance movements though, if there is external support. Um, it's not clear to what extent there is external support. And, I, and here I'm, I'm, I'm essentially implying intelligent and, and intelligence and clandestine support, um, if that will come forth and to what extent. So finally, uh, I've been speaking for about 30, 35 minutes. I'm just gonna to try to wrap up on three very big questions. Um, I don't have definitive answers. These are um, opinions that are, I'm still thinking through and still emerging, uh, still emerging. So I'd be really keen to hear your thoughts, uh, reflections and contributions. And these are, is this a new Taliban? Was a return of the Taliban inevitable? which is something we're hearing um, bandied around quite a lot, particularly in defense of the rapid return of the Taliban and the um, uh, dire withdrawal, US withdrawal and very kind of messy evacuations. And the last one being, was it all for nothing? I think on this first question, and I, I'm not an expert on the Taliban, they haven't been a focus of my study, um, but talking to friends and other analysts and, and doing some uh, recent reading, I think it's safe to say that they are a more tech savvy Taliban, uh, engaging in social media. They're much more conscious of their image, both to the Afghan people, but also to the international community. And there is a demand for credibility there. Although it's yet to be seen to what extent they will make sacrifices to seek that credibility. They clearly haven't done that in the um, staffing of their, of their new government. I think they have learned from previous failures, both in terms of the way that they initially focused on the north of the country, areas of kind of historical resistance, um, both military um, lessons learned, but also strategic ones in terms of how they're going to govern and approach the Afghan people. Uh, and they do know that the Afghans expect a very different Taliban, and there's now a demand for services um, and other areas that the Taliban previously didn't provide um, historically, the Taliban essentially were just focusing on um, justice in terms of um, Sharia law courts at, at national and provincial levels historically. But really, I don't believe that this is a new Taliban. They still have their same fundamental beliefs and they still have their same, their same goals. Um, I think there was a hope that they would be revised and, and more understanding. I don't think that's going to be the case moving forward, which does not bode well. Was the return of the Taliban inevitable? I think it's a categoric no. There are two ways we have to look at this. The first is the last two decades of intervention and where that's taken us. I think there have been major um, failures over the last two decades. I've listed just a few here. I think one of the major ones that people are yet to talk about is the, the failure to include the Taliban in the initial um, political settlement and the initial government at the time, the, the standing belief was that they had been defeated and they should not be considered. But clearly, I think that was a grave error of judgment. Um, we have seen very poor aid delivery, um, very badly um, selected projects. Um, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction has published a, a large number of reports that have showed the incredible waste in aid that's been spent in Afghanistan. I think the manner in which we've dispersed funds, pushing huge amount of funds out into a Afghan government system that couldn't absorb it and couldn't program it, really led to corruption and very limited um, efforts on our part 
to monitor the spending of that money. It's not the only reason for corruption, but I think it's a very strong driving force. I believe also that we had a very centralized focus, although we did do some subnational work, a lot of the focus has been on stepping up the kind of centralized functions of the state. Um, while you had the Taliban slowly engaging and kind of turning people in, in rural areas that were to a certain extent neglected and who are experiencing very high levels of civilian casualties, it's very easy for the Taliban then to appeal to rural individuals that have experienced um, poor governance and um, uh, deaths from uh, airstrikes, etc. That took us to a position with the US withdrawal. Um, at this, in this, at this point, the Taliban were in, a, in ascendance in a very strong position. Um, and while their return to some degree may have then been in the last six months to 12 months, perhaps inevitable, I think we could have had a great impact on the end game in terms of the way we withdrew. Um, I mentioned some of the strategic errors of the withdrawal earlier, but I think essentially we signaled intent to leave too late, very clearly that we were just going to get out. And there was no structured withdrawal uh, plan that was linked to kind of peace negotiation benchmark, benchmarks. If the Taliban did X, then we would draw down Y. Uh, it was essentially, we're drawing down and we'd like you to do these things. And the Taliban played that game. And I think we could have affected a political settlement in which the Taliban were given some um, some authority and positions in government in a more uh, inclusive scenario with some of the existing um, stakeholders and actors in the previous recently deposed Afghan government. Was it all for nothing? I think this is a very difficult question to answer, particularly at this moment, because it's a very low moment, a lot of despair. There's been many lives lost, two and a half thousand US service members, 70,000 Afghan and Pakistani civilians have been killed over the last um, two decades. And almost $2.3 trillion have been spent in Afghanistan and Pakistan since 2001, underpinning this, this effort. You know, it's very hard to tell people that have uh, lost family members um, that um, it was worth it because essentially they've gone from a situation of the Taliban being in power to the Taliban being in power. However, I think it depends very much on the reference point we take. If we just look back and say, well, very little has changed, the Taliban being then to the Taliban being now, the answer is trending towards no, it wasn't worth it. But I think actually we have to look at the counterfactual of what would have happened if the Taliban had been in power for the last two decades. Now here it's, it's a real cost benefit analysis because obviously 70,000 lives have been lost and it's hard to know how many lives may have been lost under a Taliban administration for two decades. But I think it's safe to say that there have been two decades of freedoms and opportunities and exposure to new ways of thinking that the Afghan people have experienced. It's not all been rosy, but I think that is something that will fundamentally change Afghanistan. In a sense, Pandora's box has been opened and the Taliban are gonna to have to deal with that new awareness um, in whatever they do moving forward. I'm going to leave it there. I have spoke for quite a little bit longer than planned. I do apologize. I'm going to hand back over to, to Marsha before taking questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Nason, Dr. Alaparvar. That was an incredibly informative talk and it was also very sobering. Um, but I'm so glad uh, it, it was just an incredible um, discussion on Afghanistan. There are two questions in the chat function right now and two in the Q&A function. So there are four questions for you already, which I hope you can see. And if others would like to pose a question, please do it in the Q&A. We usually wrap up at 1 p.m., which only gives us 10 minutes. So I think maybe we'll prolong our discussion maybe to 1.15 today because there, you know, there's much to discuss, if that would be okay with you. Um, so Nason, you can just start answering, maybe start with the chat, then move to the Q&A. Great, I shall do that. Thank you very much and apologies for running over. Um, starting with the Q&A, I think this is a very, very good point from, uh, from Joseph. The, the Taliban have largely <clears throat> a, a rural base of support. Um, can they find enough people to organize for the country? I think the answer currently is no, 
not only because of the um, skills base they're drawing on, but also because of the massive brain drain that we are seeing now taking place in the country. With most people who have worked for the previous administration or worked in, in senior officials with the international community fleeing the country. Um, those that do remain, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see if the Taliban take them into their ranks, possibly unlikely so. No, I think they have a very serious um, technical problem on their hands. Can I please say something about the Panjshir resistance um, and whether they might be courted by regional players? Thank you, Abdi. Um, if this was to happen, how much stability would this bring to the region? Um, it's, 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 very, it's very hard to say at this moment, and I don't have information on my hands, obviously, about whether they will be courted by Iran or India. I, there are distinct possibilities this might happen. I alluded to this in, ter in terms of kind of clandestine support that they might receive. Um, assuming that they do, would this bring much stability? I think it would only undermine stability because if they become stronger and ascendant, they will continue to push back against the Taliban uh, government and Taliban presence, which would lead to increased fighting um, and destabilize certain parts of the country. That might be seen as a positive in terms of putting pressure on the Taliban. But I think for the Afghan people caught in the way, it would just be more conflict and, and more problems to deal with. I'm going to switch to the Q&A. Brian's question, where did a Taliban force of 80,000 come from? That seems like a very significant number considering the uh, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan and the national security forces controlled the space very recently. Uh, yes, um, I mean, as you, as you well know, over the past two decades from 2008, particularly onwards, we've seen a growing uh, resurgence of the Taliban. Uh, slowly spreading through, if you think about those first maps, slowly spreading through rural parts of the country, um, very adeptly taking um, the fallout of um, US-led, uh, NATO-led airstrikes upon those communities, um, very effectively looking at those uh, Pashtun tribes, for example, that didn't benefit uh, from in, uh, international um, aid and development cooperation, those that did tended to be close to the government, those that didn't, didn't were peeled off by the Taliban, um, and kind of a, a growing, taking advantage of the growing dissatisfaction with the international presence, uh, presenting democracy as a very demoralizing force, um, highlighting the um, uh, so-called immoral behavior of women in places like Kabul, etc. So I think they've slowly gone and support in rural areas and slowly um, taken on board more and more recruits over that long period of time. Um, Kay Han's question. Uh, do any Afghans still support the socialist alternative to the Taliban or the Western-backed government? Moreover, have any, sorry, moreover, have Afghan conceptions of the Soviet-backed government changed given de developments since? Um, the first part of that question, well, actually, just an anecdote to start with, you know, uh, given my time on the ground, uh, which was in excess of about four years in Afghanistan, you know, I would often hear people say that even though the uh, Soviets didn't approach their intervention in Afghanistan in, in, a, in a democratic manner, they went ahead and developed some very good infrastructure in the country. So I think the outcomes of the... Um, let's say socialist or Soviet presence are still seen in a relatively positive light. Do they support the socialist alternative? Um, it's hard to say. I'm sure there are, there are still those that do, but I think debates now are really around um, Islamist le leanings, uh, pro-Taliban leanings versus kind of the um, apparatus that was put in place, a democratic uh, apparatus or so-called democratic apparatus that was put in place for the Western-backed government. So I, do, I still do think that there is there is some support, particularly in urban areas for the western Bank government, the previous administration that recently um, collapsed. And have any Afghan conceptions? Um, 
I think in terms of Afghan's conceptions of Soviet-backed government, I couldn't speak categorically, but I have, again, heard from individuals who I think at least appreciate the efforts or the outcomes of that um, Soviet occupation, at least. Not the occupation, not the deaths that were caused, caused but at least they managed to get something done in, in very challenging circumstances. Sorry, Kehan, that doesn't really answer your question very well. I, I acknowledge that. Um, uh, Gavrielle's question, uh, why does the G7 have Taliban assets? Um, essentially, the G7 has um, limited any international um, transactions, uh, put uh, sanctions in place previously on the Taliban, which means that those foreign held assets could not be accessed in Pakistan or Afghanistan by the Taliban. So it's not that they necessarily hold those assets. I mean, they've clamp down on, on various uh, accounts, uh, but they limit the movement of those assets as well into the hands of the Taliban as, as uh, one large disincentive. Uh, and uh, Joseph, to go back to your final question, is the Taliban takeover a proxy for Pakistan? Um, and thank you for your kind words on, on the presentation. I would say that they are not a direct proxy for Pakistan. They definitely have, um, the ear and the support of some military and intelligence assets in Pakistan, which are a very powerful entity in the, in, in the, um, the Pakistani context. Um, Pakistan, I think, are definitely supportive of a Taliban controlled government because they have good relations with them. But I think Pakistan also has a significant concern here in that um, they have suffered at the hands of the Pakistani Taliban um, causing instability in their country and a lot of high profile incidents that have shocked the Pakistani people. And I think their greatest fear would be a ungoverned space across their Western border in Afghanistan. So I think while they see benefits and have a strong relationship, uh, an unproven relationship in supporting the Taliban, but one I think is very real, they definitely would not want to see an implosion in that country because it would be very disadvantageous for them. So I think there's pros and cons there. Um, I don't see any other questions. Oh, there's one from Nizar. I apologize for missing it. Um, and let me just check, yep. Uh, what do you make of the Taliban discourse of ending foreign occupation, which was somehow supported by Biden's argument on we were not there for nation building? Does it have any credibility? Can this be a new page in the history of Afghanistan ruled by Afghans for the Afghans? I think Nizar, I mean, there's a truth in the sense that the US at one point had very large numbers of troops on the ground in Afghanistan. And looking at the US military presence and interventions in countries across the Middle East, um, I could see how a narrative could be created of um, US foreign occupation. I think it's one that we have to take somewhat seriously. Biden's argument about we were not there for nation building. I mean, that's his, his current argument. If you go back to some of his statements much earlier on when he was uh, vice president before, he did advocate in the early days for uh, the need for nation building um, efforts. He has since you know, famously opposed uh, Obama and since taken a very strong line to withdraw. Um, I think that does twin to some to some extent with uh, the Taliban's discourse. Can this be a new page in the history of Afghanistan ruled by Afghans for the Afghans? I think this this is um, a quandary I've had because one thing I think, depending on um, resistance movements and depending on um, ISK, is that as we saw the previous Taliban, there is likely is a likelihood that we will see a safer Afghanistan in terms of limited conflict because the US is not there and because the Taliban are in power. That may decline over time. And if that is the case, then this argument no longer stands. Um, but it's a trade-off for the Afghan people, potentially in terms of a much more restrictive government, but one that large rural elements of the country would probably happily settle for um, versus 
uh, and, and increase safety. So I, th I think it's um, it's a challenge. And uh, that answer will only really play out as we see what happens with stability in the country. If it's maintained, it's a real trade-off, I think, for Afghans. If not, and we descend into insecurity, then I don't think this is necessarily going to be a, a page in Afghan history that even many Afghans would be um, proud of. I hope that answers your question. I believe, no, there's one more question coming um, from, uh, from Ian. There is obviously a difference between state takeover and state consolidation. Given Afghanistan, civil society has increased significantly since 2001 and growing transnational and global links. What are your thoughts on whether the challenges you pose in your talk could lead to a lack of state formation and a fractured Afghanistan? Security, political and economic challenges could act as constraining issues to any state consolidation and like 1990s post-civil war. So what are my thoughts on whether the challenges I pose could lead to the, a lack of state formation in a fractured Afghanistan? I assumed previous to August 15th that what would inevitably happen would be a fractured state descent into civil war, um, a worst case scenario essentially, um, I'd argue. Now having seen the surprising speed which with the Taliban um, took control of the state and the manner in which they've managed to quash um, opposition, I think it's likely in the short to midterm that we will have um, a relatively strong state. I'm being cautious here, um, but as I've just said, I think it will depend on resistance movements and general pushback from urban populations in Afghanistan to what extent they are recognized. I have a feeling that the Taliban will, be, will remain in a relatively strong position and it depends primarily on their relationship with the Islamic State, if they destabilize things sufficiently, initially in the east of the country and then elsewhere. Um, I don't know if I captured the nuance of your question, but I think, um, actually no, and a second point, just before I say that, a second point will be the sources of financing that the Afghan, current Afghan state, the Taliban state receives you know, um, Afghan governments since the 19th century have always required um, external, external financing to survive. So that's also a key issue if they get large amounts of money from China or if the international community supports um, service delivery to a large extent, which is going to be questionable to stave off the kind of economic crisis and some of this humanitarian crisis, we could see um, increasing consolidation. Sorry, that's a bit of a roundabout question and I'm kind of sitting on the fence because I, I don't fully have enough information to make a decision uh, about which way it might go. So I hope that's acceptable. Carve, hi Carve. Uh, how much do we know if, how climate change and armed conflict are drivers of population displacement in Afghanistan? Um, we do know that they are the two major drivers of displacement in Afghanistan. Um, before the ascendance of the, uh, the Taliban um, in well, 2020, I can um, quote the figures for, there was around 250,000 Afghans displaced due to conflict and around 250,000 Afghans displaced because of environmental degradation and climate change impacts. Um, so you can see there are two uh, equally significant and problematic factors driving displacement. What we don't know enough about is um, the details of how this is taking place, um, the kind of uh, micro level drivers, how people are responding, um, and if, uh, if well, what interventions may stave off such um, displacement um, and what effect they might have. But I think some of those questions to an extent are now mute because of the Taliban government in place. Um, it's, very unlikely the international community are gonna to look to support them uh, to limit some of these areas, but how we program our humanitarian aid, particularly looking at um, potentially supporting livelihoods, which are under pressure from climate change and mitigating the risks of flood and drought disaster, I think are gonna be really key. Um, 
but whether we can get beyond just handing out food and money essentially and get to some of those more complex interventions um, is a question and only if we do so will we be able to address um, the drivers of climate change displacement particularly um, in the country so we don't know enough we do know they're really key but we do not know enough Jason, might I ask you a, a question or actually two questions? Please. Yes. The first is what's going to happen to the Hazaras and other ethnic and religious minority groups in the country in your you know, sort of predictions? Yep. And then also um, what do we know about flight out of the country, especially to Iran and to Pakistan of Afghans? You know, we know that this flight happened earlier and that Afghans actually many of them have ended up in in Europe as refugees right but can you talk about what you think is going to happen or what is happening now in terms of just flight of scared people leaving the country for neighboring countries as we've as we've seen there are, there are literally in you know in more than a, a hundred and hundred and twenty thousand individuals that the U.S. just evacuated and a small proportion, about five and a half thousand were US citizens. The vast majority are um, vulnerable Afghans, they've termed them. I think um, we are seeing a very large initial flight uh, from the airport. You know, Afghanistan had initially closed its borders. Uh, Iran and the Central Asian states closed their borders. Um, the border with Pakistan, I believe is currently open although both Iran and Pakistan, as you know, have very porous borders that can be, people can move illegally across, across those boundaries. Um, the chapter which you talked about earlier, in that chapter I spoke about the declining economy and depreciation of the Iranian um, currency and how that was becoming an increasingly uh, challenging space for Afghans uh, to be um, mostly Hazaras, given the common um, religious connection, their co-religionists. I think what we're going to see, and the Hazaras that I've been speaking to, friends of mine that have, some have fled the country, um, some are currently in country. At this point, I think people are waiting to see um, exactly what's happening. And I'm talking here about the um, uh, more educated individuals that had worked primarily with uh, foreign governments in the international community. Some have initially run, run and some are sitting to kind of buy their time. I think what we're going to see amongst that population is a movement, even for Hazaras, into Pakistan as opposed to Iran, because not only um, is the Iranian economy bad and they have been extreme, put a lot of pressure uh, on Hazaras to leave the country. Um, and I think that will continue. Pakistan, on the other hand, they still have been somewhat co coercive against refugees in the country, but by movement into Pakistan allows two things to happen. One from there, there is a movement into Iran and through to Turkey and Europe over ground, which I think will be a preferred route. Um, but I think for all of those individuals that wish to benefit from the special immigrant visas and now the P2 visas, which are essentially those visas stood up by the US government to, evac to allow those who work with US forces to come to the US, they cannot be processed in Iran. So everyone who seeks to, to have access to that visa will be going to Pakistan, where they'll have to wait for 18 months to have the visas processed, positively or negatively. Um, I do think we're going to see a massive uptick in the number of refugees. Um, the UN, for example, is already trying to put together programs for cross-border programs to mitigate, but also support that movement into Central Asia, for example. Um, so I think we'll still see already three, three and a half million refugees, Afghan refugees outside the country. That number will increase rapidly, I think, primarily through Pakistan rather than Iran. In answer to your first part of the question about the Hazaras, um, I, I haven't yet seen um, indications that Hazaras and other might, I mean, there are some, some stories and some reports, but I've not seen um, publicly credible reports yet that Hazaras have been explicitly targeted, for example. Currently, it's about women dem women demonstrating and those being suppressed, journalists being suppressed to cover such things, um, and lots of unpleasant stories and um, that have been communicated to me, and you'll see in the media as well, about um, the general targeting of anyone that supported uh, the previous administration or international community. The Taliban have said there's an amnesty. Anyone who wants to leave can leave, and we will not target anyone who participated in the, pre in the previous uh, government. 
but there were already indications that people are being rounded up, people are being targeted, and there be this pressure being placed upon them not to leave the country, um, even though theoretically that could happen when commercial flights start again on Thursday or Friday. And I think we have one more question in the chat. Maybe that'll be our final question. Okay. I'm just going to get to the chat now. Are there any reasons why the Taliban would not accept aid from China? It's a very good question. Um, I don't think so. I think the question is more, will China give the volume of aid that's required to support the Taliban moving forward? As I said, China has strong relationships with Pakistan and they have um, strong interest in the country, but whether they will step out of line sufficiently to give the volume that's required is, is really the question. Um, I couldn't speak to the factors that determine that at this stage, um, but we've already seen some efforts for China stepping forward. Uh, so it's kind of um, a black box that we're gonna have to wait and see how that unfolds. Sorry that I can't say anything stronger to that point. Well, with that, I think we're going to stop there. That was exceptional, Nason. I think you got many compliments in the chat and Q and A. You know, too, people really found that to be very, very informative and excellent. So I, I just appreciate your willingness to do this, especially with a new baby in the household. That uh, you know, beyond the call of duty. Thank you so much. And I do want to say um, that we're going to be continuing on Thursdays, um, usually from twelve to one. Uh, next week we're going to be beginning at be beginning at 1 p.m. instead. We have a new faculty member in the Department of Political Science, Dr. Salma Musa, uh, who's going to be speaking about Lebanon with a very interesting talk title, Escaping the Trap of Uncivic Societies, Experimental Evidence from a Lebanese Recycling Program. You may uh, realize that Lebanon's in a real crisis right now, economic and otherwise environmental. And so that should be a fascinating talk next week as well. And I hope you'll come back every Thursday for a really interesting lectures. But again, thank you, uh, Dr. Adil Parvar, for um, just enlightening all of us. That was, we're really grateful to, to you, your participating in our colloquium series. So I think we shall sign off. Bye. Thank you.